Hi, my name is Jaap Bezelius. In this presentation we're going to talk about load balancing Microsoft Exchange Server 2010. The agenda for today's presentation is why do you want to load balance your Exchange environment? We're going to talk about some load balancing history in Microsoft technology and we're going to discuss some load balancing principles. So why do you want to load balance your Exchange environment? It's all about redundancy and scalability. If you have multiple Exchange server, you can accommodate more users simultaneously and spread the load across multiple Exchange servers. Also, when you have multiple Exchange servers, you can recover if one server fails. The other servers will take over the functionality and the users won't notice anything. So it's about redundancy and scalability. Microsoft came with load balancing services in the mid 90s in NT4. And in NT4 timeframe, there was no exchange load balancing. There was only static websites, so life was pretty easy. Load balancing services evolved into NLB, Network Load Balancing Services, and it's still available in Windows Server 2012. NLB is configured as a service on the client access servers, and as such, it has a dependency to Windows Server. This works fine, but there are some drawbacks. For example, you can experience switch port flooding when it's used in unicast mode. NLB is not service aware, and when you want to add or remove a node to the cluster, it will cause a reconnect of all connected clients at that moment. When it comes to persistence, only source IP can be used, and very important, it cannot be combined with a database availability group, and this is important if you have multi-role services. The solution is to use a hardware load balancer, also referred to as the application delivery controller. This is a separate node in the network and it's independent of Windows. And the hardware load balancer can do smart load distribution, it's service aware, it has multiple persistence options, there are compression options and it can do SSL offloading. There are some very important essentials you have to be aware of before you start working with a load balancer. The setup of the load balancer, for example, can be in a one-arm versus a two-arm setup. I will discuss it in the next two slides. Routing the network packets inside your network with the hardware load balancer. You can use SourceNet, you can use Direct Server Return, or you can use the load balancer default gateway scenario. Transparency is key. Transparency means, will the load balancer pass along the original source IP address of the client to the exchange server? If not, it means that the source IP is netted to the source IP of the load balancer. If you have a one-arm setup, the exchange servers, the client and the hardware load balancer are all configured in the, in the same VLAN. This can cause some routing issues and exchange should use the load balancer as the default gateway. Routing options are to use source net or to use direct server return. If you have a two-arm setup, the load balancer will have two network interfaces. One is connected to the server VLAN, where the exchange servers are located, and one is connected to the client VLAN, where the clients are located. Source net or load balancer default gateway are the options for routing your network packets. Persistence is also referred to stickiness or affinity, and this is the way the connections are maintained during the session. Options are to use HTTP header, cookies, source IP, or SSL session ID. For distribution, there are round-robin and least connections option available. You have to be aware that distribution and persistence are not the same. Distribution is how the initial connections are set up and clients are connected to the exchange server. Persistence means how the connections are maintained during the session. SSL offloading means you have smart persistence options. And with SSL offloading, the SSL stream is terminated at the load balancer. This will offload intensive processor utilization from the client access server. And the load balancer, the hardware load balancer, typically has a dedicated chip for this. Traffic between the load balancer and exchange can be SSL if you have security requirements. And no SSL offloading means only source IP persistence or SSL session ID persistence can be used. The load balancer virtual service is an instance running on the load balancer. And the virtual service has its own FQDN, IP address and port number, 
also referred to as the virtual IP or VIP. And each VIP has its own settings for persistence, distributing, timeout and SSL offload. And important, a load balancer can have multiple virtual services. And these can be for exchange, but also for other services like Link or SharePoint. How does it all fit together? We have an exchange environment with multiple CAS servers, multiple hub transport servers, multiple edge transport servers, and multiple mailbox services. We also have clients on the other side. We have Outlook clients, whether it be Mappy clients, Outlook Anywhere clients, we have mobile clients using ActiveSync. Maybe you have POP3 IMAP4 clients or Outlook Web App clients. They all connect to the client access server and the Camp Loan Balancer makes sure that the clients are evenly distributed across the client access servers. And when CAS1, for example, fails, CAS2 will take over and the Camp Load Balancer will take care of this. The Load Balancer can also distribute SMTP traffic across multiple hub transport servers. And this can be important if you have, for example, multifunctional devices or application servers relaying SMTP traffic. When you have edge transport servers and hub transport servers, you have to be aware there's an internal round robin distribution mechanism between the two. When it comes to persistence, there are multiple requirements. For example, persistence is required for the RPC client access server, which are the MAPI clients, Outlook Web App, Exchange Control Panel and the Exchange Web Services. They all require persistence. Persistence is optional for Outlook Anywhere, Exchange Active Sync, the Address Book Service and Remote PowerShell. If you do not configure persistence for this, they will run fine but you might experience a small performance bin, uh, hit. Persistence is not required for the offline address book, Autodiscover, POP3 or IMAP4. I also refer to these protocols as the point and shoot protocols. You set up a connection to the server, get your information and you disconnect the session. So the summary of this presentation. You want to use a load balancer for scalability and redundancy so you can accommodate more users and recover from a server failure. You have to be aware of the infrastructure setup of your environment. Do you have a one-arm or a two-arm configuration? And you have to know stuff like persistence, distribution and SSL offloading. And these are all very important in a hardware load balancer scenario. If you have any more questions, please do not hesitate to contact Camp Technologies using the website camptechnologies.com slash contact support or using email EMEA support at camptechnologies.com. And the following resources are available. You can go to camptechnologies.com slash try and download your virtual load master. So you can try uh, the load balancer in your own environment. Thank you very much for attending this presentation.